Lying in the middle of a plain in modern-day Iran is a forgotten ancient city, Persepolis. Built two and a half thousand years ago, it was known in its day as the richest city under the sun. Persepolis was the capital of the largest empire the world had ever seen. But for over 2,000 years after its destruction, it was largely ignored. The life and achievements of the Persians who built it erased from history. <laughs> it is incredible. Boy, they knew what they were doing. It's incredible, amazing. But the Greeks were the sworn enemies of the Persians. They defeated them in battle, and it's the victors who write the history books. The Greeks liked to paint themselves as the creators of all things civilized, and the Persians as cruel, despotic, and backward. We in the West identify with a Greco-Roman tradition. We know the works of Greek and Latin authors, and they are going to downplay um, the importance of Persia uh, in its historical setting. Um, they're going to say that the Persians are barbarians, and this is the theme that comes over time and time and time again in the sources. Yet the Persians cannot be dismissed so easily. For 250 years, they ruled the largest empire the world had ever seen. In 550 BC, Cyrus, a tribal leader, set off with his army on a campaign of conquest. In just 30 years, he laid the foundations of an empire that would stretch from the borders of India in the east, to Greece on the Mediterranean, down to Egypt and Ethiopia, and up to what is now Russia. More than 30 different peoples were brought together under the rule of the man who called himself the king of the world. And at the heart of this empire stood Persepolis, the greatest of all Persian cities, and the key to understanding the achievements of the ancient Persians. Persepolis was begun around 515 BC by Darius the Great, the fourth king in the Persian dynasty known as the Achaemenids. But much of what we can see today lay hidden under the sands for 2,000 years. Thirty thousand fragments of these tiny clay tablets were found among the rubble of Persepolis. They provide one of the few sources of information about the workings of the empire written by the Persians themselves. The marks on the tablets are the ancient Persian script known as cuneiform. Access to the complex was through the Gate of All Nations. Human-headed bulls announced to visitors they were entering the heart of royal Persian power. It was covered with a cedar wood roof, its doors adorned with gold fittings. In antiquity, 36 columns, 20 meters high, held up another massive cedar wood ceiling. The walls were covered in sumptuous hangings. This enormous hall could accommodate 10,000 people. Something that was built with columns 20 meters high, I think it was awe-inspiring. People were probably looking up and were completely stunned. You can see how each of these columns rear up to the sky. And they would have held up there an enormous roof of beautiful cedar wood, giving us this heady scent of cedar wherever we went as well. Xerxes, the Greeks' great foe, built this the remarkable hall of a hundred columns. In terms of beauty, it's 
difficult to find the right words, really. As a feature, it's an architectural symphony. Everything is built to harmonize with one another. Each building is synchronized with, with another one to make a beautiful, harmonized whole. Persepolis is one of the great architectural achievements of the ancient world. But why did the Persian kings go to such lengths? Beyond housing the royal entourage, what exactly was the purpose of these extraordinary buildings? Over two and a half thousand years ago, the Persians built the greatest city on earth from which they ruled most of the known world. But this was no ordinary city, for it was built with a particular purpose in mind. What the city was used for was an integral part of how the Persians maintained their vast empire for 250 years. Clues to the function of Persepolis lie carved into the walls and staircases of the city in the scenes depicted in its stunning stone reliefs. They show the different peoples of the empire coming to Persepolis to give gifts and pay tribute to the great Persian king. Nubians from Africa, Lydians from present-day Turkey, Bactrians from what is now Afghanistan. From all over the empire, subject peoples came here to give their gifts to the king. The walk to the king followed a specific route through the complex, intended to maximize the impact of the architecture. If you look at the stairs, they're not something that you walk up fast. They're so shallow that you have to walk very, very slowly. That all heightened the expectation and it, I suppose, gave you a sense of the king's power. You can't just walk into a room and there you are. It has all to do with a procession to the king. All the time your heart is beating faster and faster. You're hearing languages you've never heard before, seeing sights you've never seen before. And then you get to this spot, and I think your knees are about to give way, because this is the so-called gate of all nations. This is the welcoming portal for all these visitors. It must seem like such a long walk when you're doing this. If you come from the far-flung corners of the empire, you will never have seen a structure like this. Every visitor in ancient times who was allowed to come up the royal terrace was in total awe. You have a, a perfection that, is ups that they haven't seen anywhere else. And people must have been absolutely stunned. And you walk up the imperial staircase and you find yourself in the heart of the complex. Okay, in front of you now is the great Apadama. Now this is where the mystery really starts. You can't get any closer to how the Persian kings wanted to present themselves. And what they really do here is to show we have conquered the world. We don't need to prove anything anymore. And so your offering bearer begins his journey towards the king. The relief at Bisitun in northwest Iran shows the Persian king at his most ruthless. Here, King Darius the Great enslaves those who threaten his throne. It is a public warning to those who might try to resist him. Ancient Greek accounts also suggest that the Persian kings ruled with an iron fist. One tells of how the Persians cut off the limbs and even noses of their prisoners. And yet, the reliefs at Persepolis seem to paint a very different picture. 
there you see these men holding each other's hand or one holding his hand against somebody's shoulder. They talk to each other. They sort of you know, encourage each other. The whole image that is represented here is an image of peace and of harmony. There is absolutely no battle scene. There is no violence depicted here. It is one of a Persian peace. Persian royal inscriptions found at Persepolis reinforce this image of benevolent rule. They declare that the king loves peace, not war, and subject peoples are allowed to practice their customs and religions. But is all this mere Persian propaganda? After all, these are reliefs commissioned by the king and tablets written by his loyal servants. The Jewish Book of Ezra offers an independent account. In chapter 1, the Persians are praised for liberating the Jews and allowing them to practice their religion freely. I think it's fair to say that the Persians are unique in the way that they envisage how an empire should be run. Generally, in the ancient world, there seems to be an idea of conquer, obliterate, and rebuild on our terms. We don't find that with Persia at all. By allowing subject nations to live their own lives, the Persians ensured that a multi-ethnic, multilingual empire flourished in relative peace for 250 years. Being in charge of an empire that stretches about 4,000 kilometers just west to east needed to be controlled. In order to control that, you need a fabulous network, a road system that allows you to get information from one corner of the empire to wherever the king is as quickly as possible. It stretched from Persepolis up to another Persian city, Susa, and then 1,500 miles to the west to Ephesus on the Mediterranean. Roads also went east to India and south into Egypt. The Greeks were particularly amazed by the messengers who traveled along these roads, keeping the Persian kings at Persepolis informed of everything that went on in the empire. The great Greek historian Herodotus wrote at the time that no mortal thing travels faster than the Persian couriers. Such speed was possible because of another Persian innovation, the staging post. The staging posts, manned by Persian soldiers, also ensured that for the first time in antiquity, travelers and traders could move around a vast tract of land, safe from bandits. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Persians created the largest empire the world had ever seen. The Greeks said they were an uncultured and warlike race. But here at the ancient city of Pasargade, the stones tell a different story. No archaeologist has ever found the legendary gardens of Babylon. So these channels are the earliest known evidence of a formal garden anywhere in the world. King Cyrus called his garden Paradesa. This Persian word, meaning a walled garden, is one we still use today. Paradise. It was his paradise, and it was a perfection of nature where life grew, where water was the essence of life. Ultimately, the Persian garden was a political statement. By making plants grow in an otherwise barren landscape, the Persian kings showed all who came here that they were the masters of the world. The king was practically the king of the world, and the garden reflected the power of the empire. What Cyrus did here was to produce an order in an unordered, in a chaotic, otherwise wild nature. The garden, in a way, symbolized the king's ability to control life.